Welcome to my channel, I'm Scott, and in this video I am going to walk you through the process of valuing Dye and Durham stock by analyzing their financial statements and dissecting their financial ratios so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. Dye and Durham is a provider of cloud-based software and technology solutions designed to boost efficiency and increase productivity for legal and business professionals in Canada, Australia, Ireland, and the UK. The company provides critical information services and workflow, which clients require to manage their process, information, and regulatory requirements. The company works with a lot of real estate, government, and finance companies. They currently have over 50,000 customers. The company is headquartered in Toronto, Ontario, Canada, and was founded in 1874. The ticker trades on the TSX and OTC. We're going to look at the ticker that trades on the TSX, so all the numbers in this video are in Canadian dollars. They also trade over the counter in the US, ticker DYNDF. Let's get started with the model. This is a small cap company, 1.5 billion market cap. They're trading at $21 a share and they have 69 million shares outstanding. Let's look at their financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. So you can see their free cash flow grew a ton from 4 million in 2019 to 116 million in the trailing 12 months. Net income is the profit or loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. And that was positive 14 million in the trailing 12 months. Revenue is the sales for the company and that grows each year from 44 million to 376 million. This is the company's income statement. The top line is the revenue of the sales. Below that is the cost of revenue. These are the expenses directly related to generating the revenue. Revenue minus cost of revenue gives you your gross profit. Below that is our operating expenses. These are all the expenses not directly related to generating the revenue. Gross profit minus operating expenses gives you your operating income and that was 100 million in the trailing 12 months, more than double 2021. They pay 35 million of interest on their debt, which is higher than prior years. Then other income and expenses, these are all the gains or losses, not part of the company's core operations. When it's a negative, it's probably an asset impairment. Then your pre-tax income, then your taxes, and the bottom line of the income statement is your net income, which was negative in 2021, but positive 14 million, their highest in the trailing 12 months. This is their income statement directly from their financial reporting. And this gives us the last quarter of 2021 compared to the last quarter of 2020. The last half of 2021 compared to the last half of 2020. So in the fourth quarter, their revenue was 110 million, triple 2020's number. About half their revenue is in Canada, 33 million in the UK and Ireland, and 19 million in Australia. Here's a breakdown of their expenses. Cost of sales, 14 million. Technology and operations, 20 million. General and administrative, 7.7 .7 million. Marketing, 5.7 million. And stock-based compensation, 8.5 million. Their operating income is 54 million. Last year was negative 3.2 million. It looks like they're adding debt. Last year they had 3 million of interest on their debt. This year in the fourth quarter, 22 million. Amortization and depreciation of 27 million. They do a lot of acquisitions. They had 10 million of expenses related to acquisitions. They had a net loss of 4 million in the fourth quarter. In the fourth quarter of 2020, it was a loss of 21 million. So they had a 6 cent loss per share. Last year it was 41 cents. In the six months ending 2021, they had a positive 26 cents per share. And their shares outstanding grew from 52 million to 69 million. Their quarterly EBITDA was 12.5 million in the first quarter of 2021. Now it's 63 million. It grew 5x from the first quarter of 2021. This is the company's statement of cash flows. The top line is operating cash flow. That's how much cash the company generates from its operational business. They generated more in a trailing 12 months than 2019, 2020, and 2021 combined. They spent the most in CapEx in the trailing 12 months, 21 million. This is investments in property, plant, and equipment. Operating cash flow minus CapEx gives you your free cash flow. They did pay a small dividend with their free cash flow, but they're using the rest of the money to grow the business. They're also adding debt and equity every year. They added 1.8 billion of debt in the trailing 12 months. In 2021, they added 800 million of equity. 
And you can see they do lots of acquisitions. Their investing cash flow was over 1 billion in the trailing 12 months, 800 million in 2021. This is the operating section on their statement of cash flows. This is for the six months ending 2021 and 2020. And the way to calculate operating cash flow, you start with your net income of 18 million, you add back the non-cash items on the income statement, 58 million of amortization and depreciation, 12 million stock-based compensation. You also need to adjust for changes in working capital. So they generated 72 million of cash flow in 2021. In the second half of 2020 was 14.5 million. Look how much their revenue has grown since 2017. That's the blue line. And the orange line is their operating cash flow. They had a really small and gradual growth up through 2020. And then it just took off in 2021. This is the investing and financing sections on a statement of cash flows. They spend a lot on acquisitions. In the second half of 2021, they spent 800 million. In 2020, it was 551 million. And to fund these acquisitions, they're adding a lot of debt, 1.5 billion in 2021. In 2020, they added half a billion of debt and 600 million of stock. This is the equity section on their 1231 balance sheet. They have 790 million of equity. They raised 900 million from selling their business and they lost 100 million from running their business. Let's look at the capital structure, 800 million of equity, 1.8 billion of debt. They're 30% equity, 70% debt. And they could pay off half the debt with the cash on their balance sheet. Their net debt is 930 million. This red line is their debt balance since 2017. The blue line is their equity balance. So they did add a ton of debt in 2021. Hopefully all the debt they're adding to acquire other companies pays off. They plan to acquire Link Admin Holdings for $3.2 billion, which is a lot more than this company's market cap. The acquisition should be completed in the third quarter of 2022. And the acquisition will be financed by debt, $3.5 billion Australian dollars, funded by Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, and Aris. I gave them the lowest whack on Finbox, 10%, and that's a discount rate we're gonna apply to the future cash flows. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated the terminal value, which is all cash flows past year for, that's three billion. We discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $800 million. We divide that by 69 million shares. And we get a calculated stock price of $12. They're trading at $21. So they're trading at an 83% premium. It's a sell according to the model. This chart is from Simply Wall Street and their revenue projection in 2024 is 654 million. For 2023, it's 623 million. And for 2022, it's 483 million. And I calculated their 2025 revenue of 686 million. That's based off of the growth from 2023 to 2024. And the company converts 32% of their revenue into free cash flow. So I multiplied their future revenue estimates by 32%. That's how I got their future free cash flows. The website Simply Wall Street values the company at 120. They're saying it's 82% undervalued. It looks like the stock started trading at $14 last July. And similar to a lot of other stocks, the price gets driven up pretty quickly. It was over $50 a share after a few months, but it's down about 60% since that point. So this could be a good entry point if you're bullish on this company. They started paying a quarterly dividend of two cents. That's equal to 36 basis points, 0.36% yield, which is 5% of their free cash flow, 38% of their net income. The stock has gone down 52% in the past 52 weeks, while the S&P is up 2%. The 52-week low is 21, the high is 50. And the stock is trading below its 50-day and 200-day moving average. 300,000 shares are traded each day on this stock. Of the 69 million shares outstanding, 62 million are on float, 76% are held by institutions, and 3% of the shares are shorted. It's not a good sign to see a company's employee count decreasing. They were at 200 employees, now they're at 138. This employee count is as of March 2020. So when they report their first quarter financials, we'll get an updated number. There's been two insider sales in the past 12 months. Charlie McCready sold 10,000 shares at $46. That was a great selling price. And he bought those 10,000 shares back at $27. Three insiders bought the stock, but they paid a lot more than it's currently trading at. 70% of the company is held by institutions, 20% by the general public, 
9% by venture capital and private equity firms, and 1.3% by insiders. Mauer Investment is their biggest shareholder at 16%, 11 million shares valued at 230 million Canadian dollars. Then Invesco, Fidelity, Plantro, and Capital Research. Let's look at their financial ratios. They have a really high PE of 108, that's stock price over earnings per share. Price of sales is pretty good at 3.9, a really good price to book of 1.9, but they do lots of acquisitions, so they have negative tangible equity. And a pretty good price to free cash flow of 12.8, that's stock price of a free cash flow per share. Let's look at their non-current assets. 960 million of goodwill. Goodwill is the premium you pay when you acquire another company. 980 million of other intangible assets. 12.4 million of right of use assets. These are assets they lease from another company. 3.7 million of property and equipment and 4.6 million of other. Let's look at their non-current liabilities. 1.5 billion of debt. 206 million of deferred tax liabilities. This will increase their taxes in the future. Debentures are unsecured debt this company issued. Their return on invested capital is 5%. They can cover their interest payments three times. ROE below 2%. They have a really high current ratio and quick ratio of 7.8. Let's look at their current assets. 900 million of cash, 64 million of receivables. This is how much money their customers owe them and 14 million of prepaid expenses. This means they made an advance payment for a product or service they're going to receive in the future. Let's look at their current liabilities. 83 million of accounts payable. This is how much money they owe their vendors. They receive 13 million of customer advances. 7.6 million of contingent considerations. This is probably connected to an acquisition. So if an acquisition occurs at some time in the future, they're going to have to pay someone $8 million. They owe $5.2 million on their lease payments, and they owe $16 million of debt in the next 12 months. They generated $116 million of free cash flow in the trailing 12 months. They have $850 million of working capital. They pay out $5 million of dividend payments. So it looks like the company's well-funded. They have $956 million of funding. The best way to look at ratios is to compare them to companies in the same industry. There are 153 companies in the same industry as Dai. And if Dai has number in red, they're worse than the average. If they have a number in blue, they're better than the average. I converted all the numbers to Canadian dollars, the CapEx, free cash flow, market cap, and revenue. Dai ranks 89th in market cap at 1.5 billion. The average is 23 billion. Their price to free cash flow is 13, the average is 46. So they're generating more free cash flow than most companies relative to their market cap. And of course, a lot of the numbers are worse than average because they're such a small company. So to summarize, I have them trading at an 83% premium, and this company is doing a really great job at growing. But I do think there's more downside in the stock. But in the long term, this could be a great investment. It's really hard to tell because they're so small and they're still maturing. I rank their free cash flow 7 out of 10, their revenue 7 out of 10, and their ratio is 5 out of 10. So let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. Also, if you'd like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.